the U.S. government has long favored cars over public transportation. We're spending far more, hundreds of billions more, on road improvement and infrastructure than we are on transit. New Yorkers are on edge as violent crime throughout the city's subway system reaches new highs. I would say, unfortunately, crime has been a deterrent for some people to return. The number of overall public transit commuters has also dropped significantly since before the pandemic. One alternative which could be faster than buses but less expensive and complex than the subway system is Autonomous Rapid Transit, or ART. Seventeen minutes. That's how long Americans had to wait on average to get on public transit in 2022. Transit in the U.S. is awful, uh, with few exceptions in a few places. It's infrequent. It's not all day. It's unreliable. Meanwhile, 45% of Americans have no access to public transportation at all. The real problem in the U.S. is what I would call transit deserts, right? I mean, these are just places where it is just complete and total nightmare to try to get anywhere on transit, whether to work or, you know, to play, to pick up your kids. You just can't depend on it. The U.S. spent $79 billion on public transit in 2019. Yet most public transit across the nation is finding itself in a fiscal crisis. In 2021, the U.S. was $176 billion behind in updating the poor conditions of public transit. That backlog is expected to grow to $250 billion by the year 2029. Ultimately, it's the riders who are paying for the deficit. The pandemic money is going to run out. And so there will be, I, th I think there will be fare increases, but even more, I think because of the politics of it, there will be service reduction. And many places have predicted that. So just how did public transit in the U.S. get so awful? And can it be improved? The U.S. government has long favored cars over public transportation. When we talk about money for transit, we talk about funding. But when we talk about the same public money for roads, we often hear the word investment. We're spending far more, hundreds of billions more, on road improvement and infrastructure than we are on transit. For example, U.S. railways combining commuter, heavy, and light rail grew by 945 miles between 2010 and 2020. During the same period, highways were expanded by over 100,000 miles. In transportation, we very often have no choices. If we're talking about local or area transportation, it's very often only driving. History plays a big role in this discrepancy. There was a time when the U.S. boasted a public transit system that was the envy of the world. Prior to 1920s, uh, we had a very good uh, streetcar system in our cities. These were trams that were running typically in the middle of the street. You would board them uh, at your convenience. They were often so frequent that you didn't have to plan ahead. During its peak in the 1920s, Americans living in cities averaged more than 250 streetcar trips per year. But the electric streetcar business was far from profitable. Inflation drove up the operating costs, but businesses were unable to raise fares accordingly and services quickly began to deteriorate as a result. When the streetcar companies, which were private, went to the government and so forth and said, please help us, city governments, state governments, and of course the federal government wasn't involved at all in this period, basically turned a blind eye. By the end of World War I, a third of transit companies were already in bankruptcy. And America had found its newest obsession, cars. People who wanted to sell more cars, reframed the car as an all-purpose transport necessity instead of a, a special purpose mobility tool. And when they turned it into that, you know, they, they really convinced a lot of people that you need this to go everywhere and that you're not living in a modern, progressive city until it's a city that lets you drive uh, everywhere. And with the influx of money and aid from policies, cities began to quickly transform around cars. They forced private transit companies, whenever possible, to strip out the streetcar lines. They, they created all these one-way streets to speed up automobiles. They built 
parkways. They built highways. And when people said, wait a minute, is this really the right way to do it? The answer was, oh, it's just supply and demand. It's a free market. Drivers are voting with their gas pedals, and we need to build the roads and streets for the people who are paying for them. There is a kind of a time lag between public investment in highway infrastructure versus transit infrastructure in our nation. There was uh, at least 40 to 50 years of lag, and the federal government did not get into public transportation funding uh, programs until uh, late 1960s. Today, that disparity is more evident through partisan differences. The ratio in which funding is distributed between highways and public transit became the main point of contention over the 2021 infrastructure bill. Democrats wanted just 20% of the budget to go towards mass transit, while Republicans pushed for less. Democrats eventually compromised to pass the bill through the Senate. We have identified the automobile with personal individual liberty. We also associate uh, driving particularly with suburban and rural America, while to public transit we associate with urban America. Those correlations then bleed into political uh, correlations of similar kinds, where fostering more driving tends to be something that's favored in more conservative, more Republican, more rural areas. A study from 2021 revealed that 77% of liberal respondents believe that transport policy should shift more trips towards public transit, walking, and bicycling, while 53% of conservatives believe that transport policy should make it easier for most people to drive. The discrepancy was even higher with very liberal or conservative respondents. It's very hard politically to get that kind of momentum. Um, cities are a little bit easier, but states, very hard to get that suburban voter who is very powerful in almost every state legislature, very hard to get federal officials behind this because again, the payoff politically, because it's a relatively small number of users, very small, you know, it can be one, two, three percent in most cities. That's not the loud voices. The loud voices are going to be the drivers. Funding is one of the main reasons behind the poor state of public transit in the U.S. Right now, the federal money that goes to transit services is largely limited to the capital costs. That means, you know, building the infrastructure or buying the vehicles. But the operating costs are, are where the um, transit services are really pinched. Public transit relies heavily on subsidies because it's still far from a profitable business. Take the MTA, the nation's largest public transit, for example. In 2022, less than a quarter of the MTA's revenue came from rider fares. By comparison, revenue from dedicated taxes and subsidies from local governments made up 40% of its total revenue. The cost of living, the cost of operations, the cost of construction, all of that over the last, you know, 40, 50 years has far exceeded what is collected in fares. Current subsidies simply aren't enough to cover the costs. The MTA's finances were hit hard by the pandemic, resulting in temporary aid from the federal government. Yet it still reported a budget deficit of $1.9 billion in 2022. This problem extends beyond New York City. Philadelphia's SEPTA predicts it will see a deficit of almost $269 million by 2027. Chicago's RTA predicts a budget gap of $730 million by 2026, while LA Metro's budget gap expects to reach $1 billion by the end of 2026. These financial deficits lead directly to deteriorating services. If a transit system doesn't have enough money, we can limit the hours of service, we can limit the frequency of service, we can limit the extent of the network. But all of those things also deter ridership and encourage people to depend on their car. In a 2022 survey on incentives around public transit, Americans chose accurate and reliable arrival times as the second biggest reason that would encourage them to use public transit more often, right behind lower fares. Public transportation is so expensive to run in the United States is because of the lack of usage. Mass transit need a mass to be successful. Ridership has continuously declined since 2015. And after seeing a steep drop during the pandemic, ridership has failed to recover to its previous levels. It's a vicious cycle, right? If we have less users, less riders, it's difficult to justify significant public investment in that system. And therefore, it's become more difficult to provide quality service 
And because you have a lack of quality of service, you will continue to have a lack of users and riders. If the riders are either insufficient in number or and or do not provide a fare, right, that covers those costs, you have to make up that money in public subsidies. And in the United States, the structure of funding for public transit is insufficient to basically really make up for that missing enormous chunk of money to fund operations and capital. But a thriving public transit system is beneficial for all Americans. The American Public Transportation Association estimates that 87% of trips on transit directly benefit the local economy, with nearly $42 billion in transit spending going directly to the private sector. A dollar invested in public transit is believed to generate $5 in economic returns. I mean, look what happened with Amazon. Where did, where did Amazon locate new, you know, second, second headquarters, right? Right where one of the better, you know, mass transit systems operate. Transit is really great for an employer because it gives them more options, right, in terms of labor. We can connect people to employment opportunities, including people who can't necessarily afford an automobile, which is a very expensive thing both to buy and to operate and maintain. When you don't have transportation, everything else becomes a domino effect. You may end up with not able to connect with your family and friends, not able to go do uh, doctor appointments, and uh, you know, not able to have a good income to sustain your house. And in the end, it can even benefit the drivers themselves. The more we attract people into um, rail or buses uh, or other forms of public transit, the fewer people are driving on the roads, and that makes driving better for people who want to drive. Ultimately, the future of public transit relies on whether it can receive the proper investment needed to improve services. To break the vicious cycle, we need a significant investment from the federal government. I mean, I don't think just with local innovation so we can solve this uh, problem of this magnitude. We'd have to spend a lot of money up front in order to get a, to get systems that cost a lot less to operate because you'd have more robust ridership. Cities can also be reimagined and redesigned to better serve public transit. The kind of density levels that most American suburbs have very difficult to serve effectively by transit, even buses. You have to create more dense neighborhoods, and particularly, this is really important, you have to change the zoning and the density around transit. I conceptualize public transportation as a public space. If you think about in a city, how much space we have really help people with different background come together. There is a diminishing number of uh, places that we have in our city. If we have a good public transportation system, it's like the core spaces for people with different background, different class, different gender, race, ethnicity to interact and to encounter. And I think that's very important for the future of our society. The average number of weekday riders on New York City subways in 2019 was nearly 5.5 million. By June 2023, paid weekday subway ridership was 3.6 million, down 34% from that 2019 level. The Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the operator of more than 6,400 subway cars, more than 5,700 buses, two of the country's busiest commuter trains, and multiple bridges and tunnels saw fare box revenue in 2022 plummet 37% from its 2019 levels. If you're looking at a roughly $20 billion annual operating budget, before COVID, about half of that came from fare revenues when you're still missing a big chunk of your fare revenues and you have to provide the same level of service, that obviously creates a, a big hole in the budget. Remote work is blamed for much of that decline. Compared to their 2019 levels, Manhattan office workers were at their desks on average 68% of the time during the midweek and just 37% on Fridays. Fears about public safety and crime have also impacted the city's round-the-clock subway service. New Yorkers are on edge as violent crime throughout the city's subway system reaches new highs. Three subway murders have been recorded in the past two weeks alone. 
Now to the search for the man who police say might have left a subway rider partially paralyzed. He's accused of pushing that unidentified victim headfirst into the side of a train. I would say, unfortunately, crime has been a deterrent for some people to return. I think that folks believe that there is a safety in numbers. A surge in people not paying their fares has impacted revenue, too. Fare evaders cost the MTA $690 million in 2022 across its network, 38% more than the previous year. People are less rule following than they used to, and that includes subway fare evasion. Also, TikTok, young people see young influencers jumping turnstiles in various creative fashions, and it makes it feel more socially acceptable. We're seeing it modeled by very popular figures in social media. To stem those losses, the MTA is looking to replace its fleet of subway turnstiles. CNBC got a behind-the-scenes look at a new high-tech barrier that the agency might be considering. In the old days, you had a locking mechanism, and when you paid your fare, the lock would open and you push through the turnstile. Very simple, very old school. What we've done is a big departure from that. We're leveraging not just sensor technology, but also a completely different mechanical design, a much more formidable barrier. Fare revenue is a critical component of the MTA's budget. So when will New York City subway riders return? And what can the MTA do to respond to fare evaders? The New York City subway got its start in 1904 and was initially operated by private companies with government oversight. The first route was built out from City Hall by the Interborough Rapid Transit Company with fares of just five cents a ride. The line is credited with transforming Times Square and unleashing a housing boom. The original two private companies are called the Brooklyn and Manhattan Transit Corporation. They made what we now think of as the lettered lines, or the B division, and the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, which does what we now call the numbered lines, or the A division. By 1940, New York had three competing subway systems. In June of that year, the trio were consolidated, creating one of the largest transit systems in the world with nearly 1,200 miles of tracks. From the early 20th century up until right before World War II, to be rough about it, the city was focused on building and expanding and maintaining subways. It seemed like mass transit was the way that people would get away a, a dense city. But in the 50s, support for mass transit waned, with successive administrations betting on a future of roads and highways with a focus on the car. The subway became a symbol of urban decay in the 1970s, with rampant crime and trains covered in graffiti. This subway station is the end of the line in more ways than one. At this hour, bodies roll in sleeping, or drunk, or on drugs, or just because a subway bench is the most convenient bet. On an average day in 1981, 325 trains were canceled, a third of all subway car doors were broken, and trains caught on fire 2,500 times a year. Crime was abundant. Subway vigilante Bernard Goetz shot four teens who allegedly threatened him in the 1980s. It's about time somebody, somebody protect themselves. The Nobody's protecting us on the subway. But as the crisis deepened, political consensus to rebuild the system grew. We're not going to have New York City left unless we rebuild the subway. So early 1980s, state legislature enacted a half a dozen taxes to fund the subway and commuter rail system and began to rebuild the physical assets, get rid of the graffiti. New York City Police Department, a decade later, started to control the crime on the subway. In addition to that funding, the MTA proposed a 10-year, $14 billion capital investment program to restore the system and ensure its long-term survival. Between 1980 and 2015, subway ridership increased roughly 70% from about a billion to almost 1.7 billion riders. But by 2017, overcrowded trains combined with deferred maintenance were straining the system again, leading New York Governor Andrew Cuomo to declare a state of emergency. We know the system is decaying rapidly. I think of it as a heart attack. You basically see a series of every 10 or 20 years, the MTA faces a new fiscal crisis, and then we figure out a new set of supports. The eve of the pandemic, subway's basically a success story. You know, not to say that they were perfect, but only one or two murders a year on the subways with ridership of two billion was the lowest you were ever going to get it. Well funded, you had half the revenue coming from fares and tolls, the other half coming from these tax subsidies, and the infrastructure was in reasonably good condition. 
But the pandemic changed everything as ridership plummeted to historical lows and new problems arose. The MTA handles about a third of the nation's mass transit users, about 2.6 billion riders in 2019 alone. More than 13% of New York City's subway riders didn't pay their fare in the fourth quarter of 2022, up from just 3% during roughly the same period in 2018. On an average weekday, that translates to 400,000 fare evaders, enough to fill Yankee Stadium eight times over. The problem got even worse in the first quarter of 2023. Fare evaders cost the MTA $690 million in 2022, including $285 million on its subways. $315 $315 million on buses, $44 million on commuter rails, and $46 million on bridges and tunnels. While enforcement is up, policing the subway is notoriously difficult. It's extremely hard to enforce. I would estimate there are about a thousand entrances to the subway system. To curb unlawful behavior, the MTA is looking to replace turnstiles. As I step into the aisle here, the cameras are sensing me. And if you look up at the screen, you see that there's a big red blob. The big red blob here above me, that's me. Conduit, which provides services like electronic toll collection, worked with France's National Rail Network, SNCF, to design this system. You think about the cameras and the detection systems that go into that solution are are quite advanced. To be able to detect children from parents, from luggage, from animals, and prevent unwanted individuals or, or devices from coming through. Tall plexiglass doors make climbing over or under more difficult. Flashing lights and an alarm signals a fare evader is trying to enter. The MTA has not yet decided which tech it will use, but Conduin, along with other vendors, showcased its 3D fare gate at a public MTA meeting in May. This is not your grandfather's approach to fare evasion. It's fresh, it's different, it's comprehensive. It can also detect if someone is trying to piggyback or cheat the system. If I pay my fare and someone comes in right behind me and doesn't pay theirs, the system will determine that they haven't paid and they'll get busted. In New York, the majority of subway fare evasions happen when someone leaves the emergency gate open. About 20% of people jump the turnstile, about 16% slip through the gap, and 12% duck under. Most offenses occur between 3 and 4 p.m., roughly the same time schools dismiss. Inflation could be another reason people are not paying their fares. A lot of it has to do with the economy. It's one more cost that people feel like they have to incur when they're already seeing increased cost for rent and groceries and all of their other expenses. And often they see the risk of jumping the turnstiles as worthwhile for the potential $100 ticket. While low-income residents can apply for a 50% discount on subways and buses, only about a third of eligible New Yorkers, or about 300,000 people, have enrolled in the program. One in four low-income New Yorkers can't afford to use public transportation. In the MTA's case, if we lost fare revenue, we would have, we'd have massive service cuts. And so it's, it's well worth a, a functioning fare collection system that keeps fare evasion low and stable is the important part. While fewer strap hangers have been a drain on the MTA's revenue, systems in other U.S. cities have been hit even harder. Riders on Chicago's L train in March 2023 were at 50% of their pre-pandemic levels. At the same time, Washington, D.C.'s metro saw a similar drop. In 2022, the MTA's operating budget was $19.3 billion. While majority of that money it receives comes from taxes and subsidies, about 23%, or roughly $4 billion, came from fares. By contrast, fare revenue from subways, buses, and commuter trains in 2019 made up about $6.3 billion, or 38% of the MTA's total operating revenue. To make up for that loss, the MTA received billions in federal pandemic aid. It has also increased its base fare, 15 cents for subways and buses, to $2.90, and has been promised an infusion of state money, including over a billion dollars annually, in the form of an increase in the New York State payroll mobility tax. Congestion pricing, designed to shift people to mass transit, will also collect a billion dollars annually and benefit the MTA by charging drivers more to enter Manhattan below 60th Street. But why do New York City subways lag behind their European counterparts? For starters, New York transit projects are notoriously expensive to build. Our cost of building subway assets 
is five times at the upper end what it costs to build a global subway asset. So it's not so much that the projects are the wrong projects, although that doesn't help, but it's that even when they're the right projects, like building the Second Avenue subway, digitizing the, the subway signal so you can run these trains more quickly, the projects cost much more than they would anywhere else in the world. Phase one of the Second Avenue subway, for example, along Manhattan's Upper East Side, opened in 2017 at a cost of $4.4 billion. Phase two of the project, extending the line from 96th Street to 125th Street, not expected to open until 2030, will cost $6.3 billion. The Greater Paris, the RETP it's called, has the same capital budget as the MTA. It's about 50 billion euros or $55 billion. And they're building hundreds of kilometers of new rail. We're not doing that. <laughs> We're going to get a little extension in Second Avenue subway and then hopefully repair some broken stuff. New York City's strict regulations, as well as high labor and construction costs, have been blamed for much of those budget increases. If you think of world cities like London, Paris, Singapore, there is massive federal investment in their mass transit system. Here in the United States, it's far less of a focus. Public transit gets very little funding compared to our highways and bridges and tunnels outside of the transit system. This country really favors motorists. Large debt payments are also a burden. While more than half of the MTA's 19 billion 2023 expense budget went to New York City subways and the Staten Island Rail, about 16% went to paying back debt. The remainder went to the Long Island Railroad, Metro North Rail, buses, bridges, and tunnels. A debt payment of $3 billion, for example, is enough to run the Washington DC metro system for an entire year. The MTA has to be in this constant state of begging for state assistance and federal assistance. This was happening long before the COVID-19 pandemic. Every couple of years, the MTA has to reach out with its hands out because there isn't a fully committed line of funding that really ensures the ability of the MTA to provide operations and capital improvements on a regular, consistent basis. And that trend could continue. As work from home and hybrid policies become further entrenched, it could take years before fare revenue and subway ridership return to their pre-pandemic levels. Where is the transit system 10 years from now? Ideally, you've got ridership back to 100% or at least 95% of where it was pre-COVID. Your commuter rail system is much cheaper. It's more like a European commuter rail system where the price is not significantly higher than a subway ticket. And the system is as safe as it was in 2019. I don't believe that we'll get above 75% until people are required to be in the office or in school five days a week as they previously were. And I don't know if we'll get to that point. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. Only about 2% of Americans commute with mass rapid transit like subways or elevated railways. Ideally, it's fast, efficient, smooth, and can carry a lot of people. But it also requires a lot of funding, legislative approval, and can essentially only be found in large cities in the US. The most recent metro line in New York is the Second Avenue subway. Only the first phase of this line is complete, but if it's fully funded, it would span 8 miles in 16 stations, from Harlem down to the Lower East Side carrying an estimated 560,000 riders a day. But projects like these are a massive undertaking. When complete, the estimated cost would be upwards of $17 billion, not to mention the first phase was completed in 2017 and construction on the second phase hasn't even started, largely because of funding. It wasn't until a recent $23 billion investment from the US Department of Transportation when the city started making actual plans to move forward with phase two. But the most obvious and widely used alternative to a subway system is a bus, which about 2.3% of US commuters use. Because buses sway, they jump, they buck, there's a lot of shudder and shake. And that's the big problem, the ride quality in buses. It's why many people don't like to ride them. And that might be why the buses in New York see half the amount of ridership as the subway system despite the fact that there's over 200 bus routes compared to just 28 rail service lines. The number of overall public transit commuters has also dropped significantly since before the pandemic. 
One alternative which could be faster than buses but less expensive and complex than the subway system is Autonomous Rapid Transit, or ART, which is classified as a mid-tier transportation system. It's a fully electric train bus hybrid invented by CRRC, a mass transit manufacturer in China. It's been deployed in three Chinese cities and is being considered in a myriad of cities across the world to connect larger train or metro systems in a suburb or on the outskirts of a city. The first ART system opened in Jizhou, China in 2017, which is connected to much of the country via high-speed rail, but previously lacked a proper mass transit system for its 4 million residents. And I had the same rationale as we did, that metro systems across the city were working well, but how to get to them, how to go across to those rail systems, how to join up the city to connect it, that meant going down main roads. But when they came to build light rail, as CRRC were trying, they found they couldn't. It was too disruptive. So they invented something from high speed rail, which they were producing, which took the technology and put it in a bus and transformed it. But because it doesn't run on a proper rail system and instead runs with rubber wheels on a virtual track painted on roads, it's been called a glorified bus. I went there thinking this is, this is going to be something hiding like a bus. It'll look like a, a light rail, but it is in fact a bus. But when I rode it, it was dramatically different. I could find myself feeling like I was on a train. The reason being trackless trams are autonomously guided and are equipped with sensors, cameras, and stabilizing technology like controlled acceleration and active suspension systems, giving it a smoother ride. While it can be taken over by a driver and run on any road like a bus, it's generally supposed to follow a predetermined virtual track. Right now it's used in Jijo, Yibin, and Harbin, China, as well as in Israel. And Newman says CRRC is sending a couple of the locomotives to Perth, Australia later this year. He plans to invite city developers and urban planners from across the world to watch them in action once they arrive. We've been working in Brisbane, in Sydney, in Melbourne, and in Perth mostly. And in each of these places, the local governments have worked out where they wanted to go and where they would have development that would help pay for it and bring in the urban regeneration that they want as well. And where these trams can go is partly what makes them unique. The semi-autonomous system follows distinct painted lines on the road, so routes can be changed much easier than a flight rail. The ART vehicle itself costs about 2.2 million and is estimated to cost around one-fifth the price of a traditional tram system per mile. Having a trackless tram as something that does what a light rail does and yet costs the same as a bus, that's the, the great attraction. And I think having a cheap option is, is going to make it very attractive. But as with every form of transportation, it's only as good as the infrastructure that supports it. Similar to bus rapid transit and other mid-tier transit systems, operating on a road can come with significant challenges. So for these transit systems to operate efficiently, they need to have consistent traffic flow or designated lanes and be given priority over cars. But where you need it to be have priority is where you're getting close to a station and where you need to get into that station in a way that has priority no other cars can get in there, and it's walkable for people to get to that station. New York City has the vastest metro system in the United States, but as certain areas are rejuvenated, it's become a bit outdated. Now areas that have become popular to live in like Fort Greene and Clinton Hill are famously disconnected from the mass transit system, and train lines outside of Manhattan connect to each other notoriously infrequently. For example, if you're living in western Brooklyn and trying to get to eastern Brooklyn, it's faster to go into Manhattan and back down to the other side as opposed to cutting straight across, largely because there are so few interborough lines and the bus routes are inefficient. Efforts to change this have not seen a lot of success though. The BQX or Brooklyn Queens Connector was proposed in 2016 as a waterfront streetcar that would stretch 11 miles from Red Hook, Brooklyn, all the way to Astoria, Queens. 
We are in Brooklyn Bridge Park at the corner of Atlantic Avenue and Columbia Street. And this is where the proposed BQX line would go. You know, most people sort of think the proposal is dead in the water because the um, cost of light rail is just very, very high. Cities all over the world have proposed light rail systems that either get greatly reduced or don't happen at all because of the expense of putting rail in the roadbed. It, it, it's, it's highly disruptive to like the um, business community, to, for residents. It's very expensive. Lisa Chamberlain has been pushing for New York to consider trackless tram as a new transit option. As a streetcar route, the BQX was estimated to cost roughly $1.7 billion. But I think that there is an alternative to this, which is known as trackless tram. And depending on the estimates, it can be anywhere from one-tenth to, you know, one-third of the cost of light rail. So an ART system in place of a streetcar along the proposed BQX line would be a cost-effective and efficient alternative if given priority lanes, as it can travel up to 43 miles per hour, but it would likely cut into street parking along the line. So the big obstacle, to my mind, in New York City is the fight over street space. Putting aside a dedicated, protected right-of-way for trackless tram is the only way it works. And if we can't muster the political courage in New York City to do that, we won't ever be able to experience it. While autonomous rapid transit is still in a relatively early stage of development, it's been established in disconnected portions of Chinese cities since 2017. And if the U.S. begins to prioritize public transportation infrastructure, technology like this could help growing American cities.